MDs. Yes, this is an attempt for all salon people and then party them. There, the media will be bringing you a variety of programs ranging from documentaries to discussions, interviews, news, views, sports, and entertainment. Our programs will contain matters on development, governance, the economy, and issues that are of importance to Sierra Leone. So, no left BNO because we get Bebe Bebe program then like Salon Discussion, Meets the Ministers, the President's Hour and the Gladi Gladi program, Look Me, I Look You. All this, they start soon na www.sarajemmedia.org. Na who's term this? <laughs> As we talk about burning issues ranging from politics to the economy, culture to sport, education to entertainment, corruption to the environment, we realize the Sierra Leone story is far from finished. So, Sierra Leone Media Production brings you Zubin. Zubin is the program that engages everyday people, entrepreneurs, inventors, entertainers, activists, policymakers, and politicians to discuss and debate issues relating to Sierra Leone. Zubin digs deep into the issues and stories. Zooming in ensures the debate is pushed to another level. Zooming in asks those questions that has never been asked before. So, join us in the post Chuma Bank. I was raped multiple times by my aunt's boyfriend when I was six. I was repeatedly raped at the age of eight by a close family member. I was raped at 19. I didn't speak openly about it because I was ashamed and afraid that people would judge me. I was raped at age five by my caregiver's husband. On June 17, 2020, five-year-old Khadija Sako a beautiful little girl from Freetown, Sierra Leone, was repeatedly raped and strangled to death, allegedly by her own cousin. Her death shocked the nation. But in truth, in this small West African country, nine out of 10 girls experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. Think about that for a second. Nine out of 10, that's 90%. My name is Aisha Sasei. I'm a journalist and activist. I'm joining forces with Idris Elba and other activists from across Sierra Leone to support the survivors of sexual violence with the Survivors Solidarity Fund. Please consider donating whatever you can afford. All monies raised will go to four local organizations currently providing free medical and legal services to survivors. Five-year-old Khadija lost her life to sexual violence. That same threat remains for millions of others. So this is also a call for you to use your voice, your power to draw attention to an enduring culture of rape. Together, we must end it now. My name is Aisha Sasei. I am Khadija Sako. 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 We are Khadija Sako.
We are all Khadija Sakho. When I was young, a lot of things were different. Unfortunately, most of the differences seen now are heartbreaking and are not good at all. Before now, men were strong protectors of the weak, fathers, brothers, lovers, sons. Their mere presence guaranteed the safety of women and children. But what do we do now? Men harassing and raping women. Men sexually abuse little girls. Men battering and killing their wives. Any form of sexual assault, be it rape, sexual abuse, or pedophilia is a killer to human self-esteem. Women should stop dying in silence. Speak now. The rapist should be stigmatized, not the victim. I think death sentence should be the consequence of such terrible act. And you mothers, build confidence in your children, put trust in them, listen to them when they make reports, and take necessary actions. Talking of mothers before now, women were virtuous. They were mothers, daughters, and sisters. Nurturing, counseling, supporting their men folks. But now, women are trafficking female children for money. Women are forced to be silent. All this must stop, and it must stop now. Real men do not abuse, rape, or molest women and children. It is barbaric, unacceptable. Let all real men Stand with us. Together, let's say an emphatic no to rape, sexual abuse, pedophilia, and domestic violence. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all our viewers and participants across the world. My name is Mrs. Isis Asisejalo, Deputy Chair of SL4D, and I'm gladly welcoming you all to our Black History Month celebration. It's my pleasure to open this event by giving you a brief synopsis of who we are and what we do and introduce our host and moderator. Sierra Leoneans for Development, SL4D is a charitable body comprising of a group of philanthropic Sierra Leoneans at home and abroad who have come together to form a non-partisan and non-political organization that aims to spread our mantra of one people, one voice. Our membership committed towards making an empowering socio-economic difference by addressing national development issues in areas including health, education, the environment, commerce, agriculture, housing, sports, children, youth and leadership development, etc., etc. Our objectives will be realized through the pooling of readily available resources of finance, skills, contact, and professional integrity in a practical solutions-led an added value manner across a broad range of disciplines. We aim to provide adversary advocacy and lobbying services 
to help and empower our fellow countrymen achieve better living standards. We will also aim to create a context for others to get involved in the challenges of nation building through collaboration and to ensure that Sierra Leoneans in need benefit from our endeavor long term. Ladies and gentlemen, that is SL4D. I now take up the opportunity to introduce our host and moderator for this evening. I first spoke to our host when he called to introduce himself. With a pause, the first thought that came to my mind was, waiting this again. <laughs> but he continued to confabulate about his vision. We met shortly after that, and with hours of telephone conversations, we became good friends that shared a common goal. He believes that knowledge should be open to everyone and not restricted to certain class or classes in the society. Ladies and gentlemen, he is now a social care practitioner who gave up a practice in accountancy to join ranks with others in the fight against injustice, especially against people with disabilities. This is someone who always has time for people in need, and I can personally attest to that. His love for good plasas and red wine has led him to acquire gardening skills and he spends most of his spare time growing edible leaves. It's only on Wednesdays and Saturdays, <laughs> and I'm desperately, desperately waiting to be given a tour of his wine cellar somewhere, someplace soon. He only <laughs> sleeps on Sundays, but please do not ask me how or where. <laughs> With so many identities, we are not sure which one is here today. However, to some of his friends in Essex, he's known as Otin. And to oh. some others, he's Saidu. With some Portuguese heritage, and to his Portuguese people, he's Victor Antonio Rodrigues dos Santos. Mm -hmm. And it does not stop there. With many visits to Morocco, he was named Ahmed Umar al Husaini. Oh, God. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you by the name his beloved mother gave him no other but Victor Maurice Melbourne Finney, aka the octopus of Salad Brown. <laughs> Wow, thank you very thank you very much, Lady Isata, for such wonderful introduction. You um, I am sure as the evening goes on, the ladies and gentlemen and all who are listening to us and watching us would get to understand why I spend time acquiring names and identity as opposed to acquiring qualifications and serious educational uh, and serious education like the guests that I have been given the privilege to be the front man for this inaugural debate stroke discussion which is delivered by the membership of Sierra Leoneans for Development, AKA SL4D. You have heard from the deputy chair lady of the board of trustees, and I promise you, you will hear from the chairman of the board of trustees as he delivers our vote of thanks. I have been given the title of CEO for no other reason than the fact that I like being between a man and a woman. And don't ask me why. 
You are about to hear from distinguished speakers over the next two hours, and I hope we would be able to maintain your attention and interest. The program we have lined up for you includes five celebrants who will take different angles on black history. To set the stage, I now call on the project manager himself. He is known to everybody as Morris Ferenke Koroma. I'd like to do a few, say a few words to introduce Maurice Ferenke Koroma properly. Maurice is a social scientist with postgraduate qualifications in organizational psychology and cross-cultural management. He has 17 years of working with local governments in the United Kingdom in the area of adult social care. He currently works for the London Borough of Camden as the Reablement Development Project Lead. He is a coach and a mentor to a number of people, both in and out of the motherland, Sierra Leone. He is an activist for a lot of social issues, including, but not limited to equality. Black History Month is what we are here to celebrate. People are not black only in October. <laughs> we are black 365 days a year and sometimes for 366 days. Morris will be setting the stage and putting things into context for all of us. I now call on Maurice Ferenkekoma to set the stage for our celebration of Black history. Mr. Koma. Thank you very much. Um, am I am I am I on? Can you see me? Your Can you hear me? Oh, great. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freeney, our moderator. Thank you all so much for joining this webinar. It is a real honor and privilege to be a part of this and to be able to deliver the keynote in celebration of Black History Month, organized by a very fine group of gentlemen and ladies um, known as Sierra Leoneans for Development. When I was asked to deliver the keynote, I accepted without knowing exactly what I'll be talking about. All I knew was I have to tailor my talk in a way that sets the scene well for the other speakers. That's all I knew. And then a couple of days later, I saw a post that read, I am black every day. It was quite an interesting post and it generated a lot of comments, some good and some not so good. <laughs> I went away saying to myself, we need to educate people about Black history. Without a doubt, Black history is every day. And yes, every month should be Black History Month. But the question we should be asking is, what is wrong if a particular month is actually marked as an annual commemoration of Black history? achievements and contributions of black people. So yes, October is Black History Month in the UK. Uh, for the whole of the month of October, um, events celebrating African and Caribbean cultures and histories take place up and down the country. I've attended some. I've actually joined in virtually on some of them. It is part of the reason that this webinar is hosted today. Black History Month originated in America. 
While the UK celebrates Black History Month in October, across the pond where it originated, commemorations take place throughout February. Again, one might ask, why the celebration in two different months? Should it really matter? If, for example, Sierra Leone decides to celebrate Black History, let's say in January, and South Africa decides to celebrate in say July, it really shouldn't matter. What is important is that we are taking charge and control of telling our own history. For far too long, we've allowed others to write and tell our history. I see a paradigm shift. There is a revolution of consciousness going on around the world, and it must be appreciated. Who would have thought five or ten years ago, athletes all around the world will be taking the knee in solidarity with Black people to kick out systemic racial injustice and equality? With all our contributions to science, medicine, engineering, I can go on and tell you all the areas in which Black people have actually contributed immensely. Why should we not celebrate Black history? That is the question we should be asking. We already know that Black History Month originated in America, but who started it? Black History Month was created by a historian named Carter G. Woodson, who later became known as the father of Black history. Carter G. Woodson was born in Virginia in 1875 and was the son of former slaves. Growing up across in Virginia, he was very poor and came from a really poor background. He had access to a good education and job opportunities were limited. But he ended up studying at one of the few high schools for black students after saving money from working as a coal miner. Over the years, he gained an impressive number of qualifications, including a PhD in history from Harvard University. In 1926, he sent out a press release to mark the first Black History Week in the US. Throughout his life, Woodson worked tirelessly to promote Black history in schools living an indelibly, an indelible legacy. The event was expanded in 1970, and since 1976, every US president has officially designated February as Black History Month in the US. February was chosen in the US because it coincides with the birth of former President Abraham Lincoln, and Frederick Douglass, who escaped slavery and became a key social activist. Both men played a significant role in helping to end slavery. Now to the United Kingdom and why October? There are several explanations, but the two main explanations that actually stand out uh, for us celebrating Black history in the UK in October, uh, one, that traditionally October is when African chiefs and leaders gather to settle their differences. So this month was chosen to reconnect with African roots. That might be true, we don't know. But that's one of the reasons that was put forward why we celebrate Black history in October. Additionally, many thought that since it was the beginning of the new academic year, October will give Black children a sense of pride and identity. Why is Black History Month important? I think that's really what we should be asking. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. I'm sure most of you um, on this panel and our viewers have been asked the question, why celebrate Black History Month? Well, people from African and Caribbean backgrounds have been a fundamental part of some very important world history and um, for centuries. 
This is even more evident in Great Britain and the United States. However, campaigners believe the value and contribution Blacks to society makes is overlooked, ignored, and sometimes even distorted. Education is a devolved history in the UK, so there are marked differences in the curriculum in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Over the years, there have been great calls from campaigners for Black history to be included in school curriculum in England, and not just celebrated in October. Most schools teach a history curriculum which focuses on traditional events and the achievements of white figures. For some Black kids, Black history is limited to the civil rights movement, or to Martin Luther King Jr or Malcolm X, and if they're lucky, a little bit about slave trade. But black history is much more than that. We have contributed so much to the human race, yet so little credit is given to us and spoken about. We cannot allow our history to be told by others. We need to own it and tell it. That is how, and that is the only way, it can transcend unpolluted from one generation to another. Therefore, my friends, colleagues, and viewers, Black History Month is intended to recognize the contribution and achievements of those African or Caribbean of Caribbean heritage. It is also an important opportunity to learn more about the effects of racism and how to challenge negative stereotypes. Tonight, our panel of speakers are going to do their best to bring you some of the black history you may not know about. So brace yourself, sit tight, and be prepared to learn. This is a moment for a movement. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Mr. Moderator. Myself, thank you very much, uh, Lord Morris Ferenke Koroma. The real reason why we did ask you to do the setup. It's very evident, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers are now set up to watch and listen <clears throat> to our five main speakers. Now that the stage is set, I would like to tell you what we have in store for you. There will be four segments. Segment one, each speaker will engage your attention with their version of why and what we celebrate. They have 10 minutes to do their presentation. These presentations will be interspersed by a reading of poems. We have three poems lined up for you, and they will be read for us by Dr. Coyote Robin Coker. Segment two, each speaker will share their personal view of what Black people should focus on to be able to make progress to the next level. Remember, we are celebrating the successes already. There is still more to do. So segment two will be used by each speaker to tell us what black people should be focusing on, more or less a strategic view. Segment three, each speaker will have two minutes to share with us one personal goal 
that they have set for themselves for the next 12 months, which will aim to promote the development of black people. And segment four is the bit that I have to wait for. And to show that I am really ready to wait for it, I have got my glass, I have got my bottle of wine. So segment four will be the bit where we will join the Friday music link of DJ Gravy and we will dance the night away in celebration of black history. All I now ask you to do is grab a glass or a bottle of your favorite drink, some nibbles, get all the people who are in your COVID-19 bubble, don't forget your dancing shoes. Without further ado, I will now call on our first panelist, Miss Petrina Aisatu in the Mo Camara. Miss Petrina Aisatu in the Mo Camara was born a humble but was born in a humble household in the western area of Freetown. She is a businesswoman, a philanthropist a trained motivational speaker, and a mother of two amazing children. She is an alumni of St. Joseph's Convent Secondary School and St. Edward's Secondary School in Freetown. Petrina has had a career in human resources, surveying, and property taxation. She owns the House of Petis, brand in the fashion, craft, and beauty business. Petrina is a co-author of a best-selling book of motivational stories, co-written with 19 other prof powerful professional women around the world. She's, a, she's passionate about her charitable work. She travels the world, sourcing business ideas, and seeking inspiration. She works hard, plays hard, laughs hard. Ladies, gentlemen, and all, I give you Miss Petrina Aisatu Ndemo Kamara. Well, thank you very much, um, Sir Octopus. I can see why that name is very, very defeating um, um, of you, um, because you are so good at spreading those tentacles everywhere and making people feel special when you want us to feel special. Thank you so much. Now, firstly, I would like to thank um, Sir Morris. Um, I know he's a very humble man. He doesn't like praises, but I'm going to put him on the spotlight now for thinking of this wonderful, wonderful um, gathering. Um, of celebration of Black history, which I think we should be doing um, more often than ever, because um, this is one of the times when we should be looking to promote our culture and when Black people should be thinking of coming together in order to have some sort of un united cohesiveness in our communities or in society as a whole to, to sort of make our mark. And so I want to thank him and all the hardworking people who have put this together. So Femi Palmer, you know, thank you very much for giving us this platform. Um, today, I'm going to speak to you about something that I'm very passionate about, always passionate about, and that is fashion and the crafts. I call it creative crafts when I think of cooking, when I think of, um, you know, fashion in itself, when I think of art as in you know, um, well, I call all of them arts anyway, creative arts. But I'm also thinking of um, 
art in itself, as in the painting, the drawing, and and statues and all of that, um, craft work, um, which I I enjoyed a lot of when I went to 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 Ghana and um, and, and Kenya to see local people putting together um, their talent and making something special for you. In like a second, you can go into places like African countries, third world countries, where they can put something for you together in a, in a matter of minutes. These are sort of the sort of talents that we need to learn to celebrate now. And for those of us that have been exposed and lived in the West, to try and incorporate some of what we've learned from the West into what into our cultures and what we do. So firstly, I'm gonna to speak to you um, about our struggle over the years, um, black people, our struggle over the years um, um, as a, in finding the rightful place in society where fashion is concerned. And then I'm gonna look at the black designers who have already set the pace in fashion and lastly, I'll speak to you on various fashion and creative arts trends that have now evolved and claimed a permanent place in not just uh, Black culture, but in also um, society as, uh, as a whole. Now, historically, the relationship between the fashion industry and uh, Black culture has always been complex. Um, however, the historical and cultural importance of Black culture and talent and its monumental influence in fashion today must be acknowledged. I mean, it must be acknowledged. You look around today and you see a lot of what we've done in terms of our, our contribution of fashion in society. Black people, as we normally would say, have the swag. I mean, we, 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 we bring sexy into fashion and it, it is worth celebrating that. Um, many fashion houses, brands and, and celebrities seem not only too happy to uh, um, only seem only too happy to appropriate whitewash and profit off the black culture without respectfully acknowledging our history. We see a lot of times we create things, so we are the back of house. We create things and we have people collect our ideas and turn them into something special that we should have been celebrating. So we want to take that back and we want to be able to celebrate that in little forums like this, um, gatherings like this, so people be aware of where certain things originated from. And with that being said, it is only extremely important to still recognize the iniquities of the uh, um, acceptance of the black style and culture, which has been marginalized it has been misrepresented. We have been stereotyped. We are called overly flamboyant, but that is our culture. Colors is what we are all about. So we celebrate cultures as in our African prints and is, as in our um, country cloth. If you look back, back in the days, we used to have the black and white in country cloth. But if you look now, there's a lot of colors coming into them. Now we're fusing colors into the sort of fabrics that we are producing, especially in Africa. Now let's look at some of the designers um, um, that have made their mark in, um, in fashion that have not been so celebrated. We're looking at Anne Lowe, who thrived in the 40s and the 50s. Now Anne Lowe was one of the first internationally recognized African-American fashion designer how one of a kind designs were commissioned by New York most famous and wealthy families, such as the Rockefellers, you know, the DuPont and Roosevelt. And at the time she was regarded um, as society's best kept secret because of her race. So they didn't want, they want to wear what she was doing what she was producing but nobody wants to acknowledge it the newspapers would not say and 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 that went on for a lot and lot for lots and lots of years and while she might not have gotten credit for many of her dresses one example of a dress that she made was for olivia the 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 ha havillard and that design was was really really outstanding 
and she wore that dress to accept an Academy Award for Best Actress in 1946. 1946, Law was mentioned in the Washington Post and for arguably one of the most iconic gowns. And that was when paper, newspapers and other fashion houses became interested in Anne Lowe. And um, now we have another very creative and very powerful fashion designer back in the days, who is Zelda Win Valdez. Now, she was the lady who was commissioned by Hugh Hafner to um, design the Playboy Bunny. So she designed the Playboy Bunny, and, and that was worn by a lot of the playmates back in the days, and the wannabe playmates. And probably we, we go to shops now and buy some of these bunnies, you know, for whatever reason it is. We don't want to go there. But yeah, this Playboy bunnies um, um, became very famous for um, playmates back in the days. And um, now, you know, you, you have um, um, Zelda being nicknamed the Marilyn Monroe of our times, of, of her times. Um, because she had this flamboyant dresses and she went on to open a shop in New York Broadway where she thrived to become the leader of the Black African fashion um, um, group back in the days. And she opened that shop in 1948. And that was located in Broadway, by the way, in New York City. Her designs were worn by famous celebrities in New York and around, like Dorothy Dandridge, who we know was very famous back in the days, and Ella Fitzgerald. Um, her had, um, in 1949, Valdez was elected president of New York chap chapter of the National Association of Fashion and Accessory Designers, an association, an organization of black designers that was founded by educator and professional activists Mary McLeod Bethune. Now, in our recent times, we all know about Oswald Bowden. He was a Ghanaian of Ghanaian heritage who does outstanding outfits for men. I mean, he was born of Ghanaian parents. Bowden was the first tailor to present a collection during the Fashion Week in New York. In 1994, he opened his own retail establishment just off Savile Row and was the youngest and most, and the youngest and first black tailor to ever do so. So he became famous back in the days, but we don't hear much about him now. I remember when I came in the 90s, in the early 90s, we knew what he was doing and he was all over the place. Now, when we think of black people and fashion, what do we think about, especially for women? We think of some of the fashion trends that we have set that comes way back from history. For example, the hoop earrings, which I can see my, my girl, um, Maria Ma is rocking one, one of them. They come in different shapes. She's rocking it. So that tells you we are really celebrating black history and fashion. She's really, really represented tonight. Big up Maria Ma. Um, I was going to speak about hoop earrings tonight and you wore one. Well done. Um, so that dates back um, as far as the Bronze Age. That's the fourth century Africa. Sudan in particular, which was then named Nubia, where they were constructed from bronze. They were done from silver and gold. Hoops were also essential accessories for the Egyptians. In the Jazz Age, um, hoops were most notably adorned by African um, American born black French jazz performers and civil rights activist Josephine Baker. And then came hip hop. Hip hop just brought the hoops right where we were sitting in our living rooms on TV. You have the Missy Elliott, you have the Lil Kim, you have the Eve, you have the Erika Badu who was rocking it in the days and all contributed to popularizing the hoop earrings. Then we have the, tel the trainers culture, what in America they call the sneakers. 
Um, it, the trainer culture, um, that, that it, it started, the beginning of that was in the 1970s America, where trainers were made transition from sportswear to a form of cultural expression. We can tell that black people brought sexy back to trainers. And then we now start thinking of the hip hop cultures in the 1980s when um, we started seeing the Michael Jordan, Air Jordans come into effect. And this took over the young black kids. And in, in, in fair conclusion, um, that the urban black youth launched the popularity of trainer culture. And as they are predominantly worn by kids of culture, the explosion of signature basketball trainers birthed a generation of trainer co um, collections and, and people collecting trainers, which is now very symbolic in, 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 in our black cultures. Then we have the nails. Oh, the nails. I call them talons. Um, nails, he, it originated from Egypt way back in the 3000 BC. And they were thought to have been worn, um, to, Egyptians were thought to have worn nail extensions created from ivory, gold, and silver, and bone. Acrylic nails were created in the U.S. in the 1950s and became popular with Hollywood stars. However, the first black woman to be on the cover of Vogue, African-American model, Danielle Luna, mostly notably wore them on the cover of Twin magazine in 1966. Acrylic nails are now our thing. I mean, you see a black woman, she's running to go do her nails. She's running to go get her manicure done. And we see the sort of artistry in nails. Now, not that I'm into them, but they are all over the place and very commonly um, um, uh, 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 seen among black women. So um, in the 19... 90s, honored acrylic nails were popularized during the rise of hip hop and cultural and, and Arabic RB culture, where you would see our artists, you know, displaying their nails. The bigger, the longer the nails, the more, the more trendy you are. And that became a, a thing for us black people. Then we have wigs. Wigs is us. We are wigs and wigs is us. So um, wigs has become a very, very um, common thing to see us Africans into. And in the 15th century Africa, wigs weren't much um, used. In 1951, African-American hairdresser and wig manufacturer Christina Jenkins invented the hair weave by sewing synthetic, um, by sewing synthetic hair into our into her client's own follicles. Now, as we can see, wigs is all over the place. But when I think of fashion, I think I, I want to focus a little bit on Africa in my last um, few minutes. Um, Africa and fashion. We have a sort of different way of displaying fashion as opposed to fashion in the West. Fashion originate, uh, or, origina the origination of fashion in Africa is our bodies. Our bodies, if you look at South Africa, they were very little. It's mostly us using um, cultural um, beads and raffias, but we sort of display our bodies, the best of our bodies, one of them being the shoulders, which is why I am here covering my shoulder. We covering my shoulder with cowrie, which is very, very, I do not joke with my shoulder. I mean, if I don't fix any part of my body until I die, it would be my shoulders because it originates from our culture. Your shoulder makes you, I tell you, ladies, your shoulder makes you. That is the origin of our culture in Africa. And one of the ways, if you look, Look at the Bini people. They used to display beads on their shoulders, on their necks, to cover the, the parts of their bodies that they do not want to show. And in Africa, still in West Africa, you, in, in South Africa, 
you will see women displaying their twin towers. You know, you, you, you know, display their twin towers. It doesn't matter how old they are. They display that. They display their hips. That's in product. So the outfits that we wore, it was not all these bright colors, the African prints, it was not the cottons. It was just us plainly going out there and showing off our bodies and showing off our bodies by covering them with things like leaves. We covered them with fashionable things like um, 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 beads that we created. And that was what our culture was all about. So ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, African culture, when it comes to black history, rocks. We rock. So black history, this is what I have to present to you as our, as our fashion and, uh, and crafts, you know, per se. Thank you. Thank you very, 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 very much, Lady Petrina Aisatu in the mall, Kamara. You know me too well. You know how to pronounce that name. I'll tell you, Sir Victor. All right. Now, it's fabulous to have heard all of this black culture uh, stuff, and I a name would be stuck in my head for a long while, Zelda Valdez. What's a name? Yeah. I would I love the name. Yeah. Now, I'm aware that we have used a little bit more time, but as you would hear from pilots when you fly, they say, well, we started 15 minutes late, but we would make up the time mm -hmm. to get there as we planned. Only heaven knows whether there is a shortcut in Creole, we say Yadrod, which they use to then still get there on time, or probably they break the speed limit. Well, we're not going to delay any further. I uh, would want to ask our tech team to see if we can share screen so that our next panelist, next contributor, would be able to do the poem that has been well laid out for us. As the screen sharing is starting, which I am hoping that um, our next contributor will be able to um, join. I'm just checking to see if my screen is showing that it's been shared. Um, before I introduce, I can see the thumbs up from our tech team. Wonderful, thank you, sir. So I, uh, I'm going to try to save some time with the introduction of our next uh, speaker, who is, um, who needs no introduction actually. So the simple fact is we now have Dr. Coyote Robin Coker to do a poem for us. Dr. Coyote Robin Coker is a Cambridge-based academic, is a writer and author of Dancing on My Way, a collection of poems published in the Sierra Leonean Writers Series in 2019, and it is available on Amazon. Dr. Coyote Robin Coker. Uh, thank you, Sir Octopus. Um, I am Honored to be given the opportunity to fill in the uh, commercial breaks um, on this program. I will be presenting some poems by Sierra Leonean writers, and these are poems from a podcast project which I recorded recently, um, titled um, Lockdown Poems and Poems for the New Normal. The first reading I've chosen is by someone I feel very privileged to call my friend. And he's none other than the poet Ahmed Koroma, a.k.a. One Bad Stokes. Ahmed is actually an analytical chemist by profession. Uh, he applies his trade in uh, California, USA. But as you would expect from someone who attended the best schools in Sierra Leone, that is um, St. Edwards and the Prince of Wales, he is also a writer of no mean accomplishment with an eye for imaginative detail, especially when writing about the area 
where he spent his childhood, which is Freetown Central One. As you might perhaps expect, therefore, the poem of Ahmed that I've chosen is titled Freetown. Uh, can I have um, poem number one? Poems for the New Normal, selected and read by Coyote Adesimi. Poem number one, Freetown by Ahmed Koroma. Epigraph. Of all the years I ever knew, those final ones I spent with you, David Gates. Dear Freetown, when I return to you, I do not expect a delirious mask, nor the pretense of a blissful town. Rather, it is the authentic you, the battle scars down your tired face, reminding me of your stunning past. When I return to you, I want to be greeted by gentle fumes, the smell of hot pepper and concrete mixed with odor of decayed compost, sewage rats and roaming pigs. I love you for who you are and for who you once were. So do not paint the trunks of trees nor whitewash the cemetery walls. I do not want to be welcomed with buntings, flags on crisscross wires on steel poles and wooden fences. Place my picture next to the woman who spits at passers-by in broad daylight. Let her scream my name out loud as my vehicle gallops through a heap of dirty rags. Let the mayor not wear a broad medallion and tassel of many colors, and the bishop his mitra preciosa. Let the priest sprinkle holy water at the doorstep of the tabernacle across where statues once stood. When I return to you, I want the Imam to read Surah ul Nas to remind me of my battles with rats deep in the abyss of the Odokoko. I want him to scream the Azan atop of that grassy hill where we used to herd sheep. Do not bake rice bread and sweet ginger cakes for me. Let me dip my hands in palm oil soup and slimy intestines. I fell in love with you when your roads were deserted and blue, and I still do. So when I return to you, I want to see faces old and new. Bring out the drums, the stainless steel bowls. Let the girl with bells on her toes and the boy who walks on stilts Tap every touch-me-not plant along the bushy path. Let the leaves tie their lapa before their husbands arrive. Let the boy who plucks cocoyam leaves to shield from the inclined rain roll his bicycle rim down narrow streets. Hang colorful fanus on every porch. Let the grill serenade me with melody and the prophet who speaks in tongues predict the next firestorm. Elevate the houses made of wood on pillars high into the folding clouds. Raise the window blinds way higher, exposing the curtains with rainbow colors. You are a picturesque town and your beauty still shines through the blemishes of yesteryears. Illuminate the sea with that radiant smile that reminds me of your lush greenery, now mixed with red clay and grime that seem to dampen your spirit. But your essence remains strong. You are a town of every kind of every hereditary bloodline. Commission the Bubugan to play rhythm for women and men in a soulful trance. Bring out the two-headed king, the one who raises his staff to ward off evil spirits. 
Let the pedestrians skip puddles after a rainy night. The mango flies and mosquitoes compete for my ears. Witness the overflowing stream emptying into the bursting bay. Observe the foam drifting down from the brook where girls wash clothes. I will follow the drifting debris to the waterfall underneath the bridge. Remove the never-die leaf hidden within the crumpled pages of the old Bible at the chapel and read the inscriptions of the past. Bring out the pots and pans. As we gaze at the lunar eclipse and wake me up from a stupor so I can listen to the old woman passionately pleading to Yankuba to save us from perpetual darkness. I return to you to read poetry at the bandstand where we used to do improv and chew cassava and groundnuts. It is the voice of the unknown, the evoking sound of the hunter's flute that entices me back to you. You are my favorite town, my hamlet by the sea. You set me free to roam the distant lands and I am returning to you. This poem is from a collection titled The Moon Rises Over Isale Echo by Ahmed Koroma. And it's available on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Coyote Robin Coca. What a wonderful poem, and I really enjoy the sights of our beloved country. And uh, thank you very much for that. Um, obviously, I did promise we're going to try to catch up with time. Our next um, presenter is um, going to talk to us about um, Black Web. I don't even believe that I don't even believe that black people do have wealth. Well, I'll wait for Mr. Zainu Ofosu Savage, who is going to tell us how we should celebrate black wealth. Zainu Ofosu Savage is an alumni of the Albert Academy. I wanted to get up and punch Dr. Robin Coker, but I know I would get into trouble when he said the best schools. But I'll keep that punch for him for next time I see him. Zainu Ofosu Savage will not agree with him. He is an alumni of the Albert Academy, the Greenwich School of Management, and the Plymouth University. He is an entrepreneur and a business consultant. Robin Coker but I know I'll get into trouble. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Crystal Enterprise Limited. He loves fish and plantain. He is one of the very few men who I know who love music more than football. Please don't ask him to talk about jazz. Mr. Zainu Ofosu Savage. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. As you can see, I'm amongst giants. Giants, indeed. I'm this minuscule, I'm minute, I'm a miniature among statuettes and statues. And um, in that light, I will link that to my continent, my race, my people, my beautiful Africans, my black people all over the world in all shades. Yes, we are rich. Yes, there's something called black wealth. Black wealth, for us, 
it's a natural gift from mm. God because it is, it is right under our feet, especially if you're Sierra Leonean. You did geography at school and you were told and taught about diamonds in corner, gold in Maboroka, root tile in, in, in um, um, Moyamba, uranium, platinum, silver, and now we are at mineral, not to mention oil. So from Sierra Leone in West Africa, to Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, let me apologize. I have people calling while I'm doing my presentation. I, I, I'm very sorry. <laughs> if only they'll go to Facebook and see what we're trying to do here. They wouldn't do that. Again, I do apologize. So yes, to Congo. Um, in the last two centuries or so, we've had the Belgians, the English, the French, 1891 and 1881, they decided to carve Africa for themselves. Based on our geographic value, the Belgians took the Congo. The English and the French took part of um, Gambia and parts of Senegal. The English took Sierra Leone and the British trading company took Nigeria. Subsequently, us, the black Africans, were disenfranchised. We were put aside. Decisions were made for us. Decisions were made about us for our own money, our own wealth. And the worst of it is, it was not only the natural resources that these decisions were being made, decisions were being made on our lives as well, because even our lives were a commodity to them. Well, this is the new Africa. This is the new African. We're not crying no more. We're not playing the blame game and we're not victims. So how do we now take charge of our wealth? What are the things that we have to invest in as Africans to actualize and realize our full potential? What are the factors that are holding us back and what are the actuators that will propel us forward? We have to look at the human value, the commodity value. So I'll go first and elaborate more on human value. We have the youngest population in the world from 15 to 25. Don't let me start on the, the natural gifts. It's a pandemic one. Everyone professes the worst for Africa, and yet we, brought, we bear the least of it. That's how blessed we are. That's how fortunate we are. As a continent, as a people. So if we take our wealth and amalgamate mm -hmm. Put it all together, form conglomerates, form reserve based on the resources that we already have from North to South to East Africa. We will be the richest continent on earth. This is a very dangerous thought. But I'm sure you guys will protect me. We have to say this. Some see us as donor nations. And unfortunately, there are these of us and some of us who believe that we are donor nations. We are not donor nations. We don't really have to beg for absolutely anything. We have to build the infrastructures that we need to create the financial goals to create the type of results that we need. We have to be self-innovative. We have to create platforms 
that will generate ideas. And these ideas will become process. And this process will become actualities. We have commodities. We have land. We have everything there is as a factor to make us the wealthiest people on earth. So what is holding us back? I'm not a politician. I'm a money scientist. So I say this to all of us. If we adopt the same technologies in the West, to manufacture our goods in Africa from raw material to process to finish good, then we export, then Africa is a winner. If we continue to mine on license and process abroad mm -hmm. and depending on tax, and some of these tax are limited, then we will stay the way we are. Natural disasters will occur, but I think we're wealthy enough to be able to mitigate this without foreign aid. Because foreign aid is a window to some of the calamities and catastrophes that befall us now, right now, as I speak to you. So what do we do to amass this wealth? We have to be nationalistic mm -hmm. in terms of protecting the things that we have. For the fact that we have identified mm -hmm. natural resources. So that means, yes, we have a lot, but we haven't done the feasibility studies to know how long they last. So we cannot really bank on that. So we have to go to the next factor, which is our human resource. We take Malaysia from third world to first world. You have Malays, Chinese, Indians, Bangladeshis, and others. Put in a section in Asia by the British with no minerals, no natural resources. They don't even have a common language. From 1960 to 2020, their GDP is over 100 billion. You take Sierra Leone at the same time, we have the very first university in West Africa, the very first locomotive in West Africa, the very first functional judiciary in West Africa, the very first act bishop in West Africa, Christian Cole was the very first alumni graduate of Cambridge College from West Africa. We had the very first graduate from Sanders University Military School in West Africa, West Africa in Cambridge. I'm talking to you now. I have a Cambridge alumni sitting right next to me on Zoom. This is how wealthy we are in human resources. So if we're this wealthy in human resources, and we're also wealthy in natural resources, why are we poor? Mm -hmm. What are we doing wrong? In the next segment of this presentation, we will highlight what we're doing wrong and what we can do to mitigate that wrong. And when we do actualize, We must also know how to spend that money. We must also know the factors that will allow us to continue to be rich so we don't be the first son inherits the wealth and his sons inherit nothing. So the African mindset has to change. Yes, we're from flamboyant and flashy, we love shiny and bling, 
But the new Africa has to allow the intellectual to take charge. The new intellectual has to be business-minded, street savvy, politically smart, and a avid negotiator. But he has to be an intellectual. The new African will not allow charismatics to lead us anymore because we're talking about money here. Charismatics have had their chance. The new African will rely on research, market research, will study commodity and equity, will study real estate, will study pH level on land and farming land. The new African will explore science to provide energy, clean air, and water. And the new African is wealthy enough to be able to pay for that with no aid, with no experts from abroad, with no consultants from abroad, with our own resource and our natural resources. So if we knew and we've known for a fact that we were colonized and these two very valuable assets were taken from Africa. And now we're left alone. So why don't we utilize these two valuable assets? In my next submission, I will elaborate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Mr. Zainu Ofosu Savage for that insight into black wealth. Now, I am normally a very strict host. For those of you who know me, I am aware that <clears throat> this is our first outing and uh, we are trying to develop how we all keep to our time frames. So I've got a lot of catching up to do because I've lost a few minutes because some of our um, panelists are so passionate about what they do and what they believe they have gone a little bit over time. Can I encourage the rest of the panelists to try to keep to our time frames of 10 minutes, section one, three minutes, section two, two minutes, section three. Now, if we are not able to make up, which is saying that the timing is going to be stretched, then I will have to reduce the next segment instead of to three and two, it will become two and one minute. So we have to catch up because we are on a tight deadline. I'm looking for all the ad road them to make sure say, we reach there on time. Thank you very much. Let me say, not continue for waste time. The next segment, the next bit for us is a second poem for Break We Boredom, as um, Dr. Coyote Robin Coker takes us through to poem two. But before I, I switch over to Dr. Coyote Robin Coker. I want to recognize that we're having lots of questions coming in through the chat. Because we try to keep this to two hour segment, it's impossible to cover everything we need to cover and still answer all the questions. What I would say as a general rule, four questions, follow us on Facebook and all the social media Join us in terms of membership, and you will be able to get answers to all the questions that you are asking that we are not able to provide today. But we're going to try, if we have time, to answer some of the questions as we see them coming in. So keep the questions coming in. Dr. Coyote Robin Coker. Thank you very much. My um, next poetry reading choice is... Um, a poem in Sierra Leone Creole, and it's by the late uh, 
Emeritus Professor of English, Eldred Burosimi Jones, who you might know among many other stellar accomplishments, uh, co-compiled the most authoritative Creole English dictionary with his fellow academic uh, professor Clifford File. This poem, which you're going to listen to now, narrates the travels and the growing pains of the nation of Sierra Leone. It's titled Ben Ben Wood. Uh, take my straw, poem number two, please. Lockdown Poems, read by Coyote Adesimi. Poem number seven, Ben Ben Wood, by Eldred D. Jones. The wood long and tranga, and full with chuk chuk, and be big stone. Sometimes we get lost inside dark dark bush, and don't know who side we did. But we fed so till we come back now wood. Now, although we foot all down booths, we don't claim rich pant up the mountain. With Watana we eye, we they look the old country where we self don't well. The green tick them don't black with fire. Fine, fine grown for plant don't soak with blood. Tongue all broke. People all don't scatter and not get place for tap. Peking they not understand how all them picking life just poor so. Small, small, we don't charm the truth. Till we don't drape justice come out middle tongue, make it go hide in a corner. By way, all man just they look for a young better one. And not be seen but in neighbor own. We don't pull all things for all man. Because one man no one take control. We don't choke freedom inside and kill him. And pay for turn we have to slave. Now we can't read this. Now we salon this. But we don't dip on top of the mountain. The water don't wash we eye and make we see good fashion. We don't see we self and we can start new life. So, how we the walk a can down the mountain, make we tap na wood, and call we foot na water side. Make we fend we all two back, make we sharp them, dig the ground, and let we plant two one them more. Make we mix dirty, and build we host them back. Make we eat, but make other person get their own. Make we guard with freedom and not sleep. Make we coax justice come back na tongue. Make them pick him be picking back. Make them eat bread and left for charm stone. We human them go be mama for the whole nation. We go build this country back. We wait don't walk inside fire and come out clean. We will not hear it and crack and fred. We will all look light in inside in yai and don't soak na rain. We go build this country back. The man then the woman then team up, strong like rock. And God no make we country po. The Lord them, where we make, we not for take them play. We not for begin crutch them and poil them. And make we not sell the one old country for we own benefit. So we not come from all parts of this country. Manu, Umanu, Pikino, and make we all all on. And waka go inside the new salon. We they grab like early morning sun. This poem is from Big Sol Noba Cook Soup, an anthology of Creole poetry edited by Shekuma Akma and Marjorie Jones, available on Amazon.
We can't hear you. Thank you very much, Dr. Coyote Obinkoka. I am um, <clears throat> fascinating um, read, and um, I'm sure we are all thinking of getting a copy since we now know they're all available for sale. And um, we must say, once we've seen Amazon and promotion, that we do not get any funding from advertisement. We would like to at some point, but we don't get any at the moment. So it's not paid for advertising. It's how the uh, poems have gone. And I, again, we are encouraging everybody to get educated and learn about our culture and our poetry. So it's a good start for us to pick up. Our next um, panelist is none other than Mr. Prince B. Williams. He's going to talk to us <clears throat> about <clears throat> Pan-Africanism and the African diaspora, of course, focusing on their contributions to the independence movement. Mr. Williams have 10 minutes. I wouldn't worry too much about things, so we're still on track. We may cut off some of the time on the second and third segment to still finish on time. But this is the most important one for us to celebrate Black history. Mr. Prince B. Williams is a qualified lawyer and probation officer. He currently um, works um, as the chief, ex the acting chief executive officer. Sorry, I don't promote you before even they confirm it. <laughs> the acting <clears throat> chief executive officer, CEO, and the registrar of Corporate Affairs Commission in Sierra Leone, which has responsibility for the incorporation and registration of all companies in Sierra Leone. You can tell that he is a lawyer. When lawyers speak, we don't understand. He is the man who is going to be in charge once he is confirmed of all things to do with company registration, incorporation, but that's what they mean for us, the ordinary people. I had to look that up in uh, Google. He also supervises all company affairs. We're proud to have him in our midst. He's not much of a food lover, even though he professes to love Afro-Caribbean dishes. He surprised me when he disclosed to me that it, he was teetotal. Jesus helps the women around him. He does some pro bono. Again, you can tell he's a lawyer. I think for ordinary people like us, he means free. He does some pro bono work with disadvantaged people, mostly civil matters. And he is unashamedly a gunner. Mr. Prince William, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I mean, I really do like that uh, um, introduction. Um, it's really set things up really nicely for me. Um, first thing I must say, uh, I have to thank you guys for setting up this wonderful, wonderful platform so we get to celebrate um, all things black, all things African, all things Pan-African. I think it's high time we start doing things like this. It's high time we start taking the lead in doing things like this. Now, I'm, without much ado, I'm just going to go into things. And like you've already mentioned, I am Prince Williams. I will be talking about Pan-Africanism, the black diaspora, and nation building. Pan-Africanism, black diaspora, nation building. Three things that must be at the top of everything we are doing. 
I mean, it's interesting, the first two, first two speakers in Miss Katrina and Mr. Savage, I think they've actually laid things quite well in terms of Pan-Africanism. I mean, Miss Katrina talked about arts and craft. That ties into what I'm going to talk about. And Mr. Savage talked um, about black nationhood and black wealth, ties into what I'm talking about. Now, when we say Pan-Africanism, the first thing I'm going to say, I'm not here to talk about the tragic things that has happened to black people over the centuries. We all know those stories. We all know about slavery. We know about apartheid. We know about the wickedness that was perpetrated to us by people like King Leopold of Belgium, a man who's unashamedly still been celebrated by Europe and Europeans. We know about people like Christopher Columbus, who was heroes, heroes to Europeans, but we know these people are demons. That is not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about how we are going to pull our resources, social, political, economical, um, um, cultural, religious, spiritual, are we going to pull those resources together so we can build on the gains that we've made? And make no mistake, black people have made gains. So all this doom saying you see on TV, all these naysayers that you see will come forward and say this and that about us, is not necessarily true. I can say that now because I happen to be in Sierra Leone and there are times when I sit around, I'm not saying we do not have our problems, we do have our problems, but there are times when I sit around, I see stories on social media, social, social networking side, the newspapers, and I smile because I'm thinking, well, I am here, but it's not that bad. But we have to understand that the reason why we have those things is because we have been conditioned to more or less function, to more or less focus on the things that are negative about us. That is why I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Pan-Africanism and how it connects to our collective future. Now, what is Pan-Africanism? It is the idea that people of African descent have a common interest and should be unified, simply put. People with a common background, common history, common future must come together so they can see things the right way. At the core of Pan-Africanism is a belief that African people both on the continent of Africa and in the diaspora, share not merely a common history, but we do share a common destiny. We must look in the same direction. This is why we keep getting, getting it wrong, because everyone is doing their own little bits and pieces, and really and truly it's not working because it's not connected. Now, just so before I move forward, Mr. Savage even talked about wealth. And I, previously, even when the speaker, when the chairman was introducing he made a joke. He said, well, I didn't know anything about black wealth. Believe me, Mr. Chairman, believe me, viewers and listeners at home, we do have wealth, plenty of it. And not just under our feet where I'm standing. No, we have wealth. We have money in the bank. We have ideas. We have visionaries. We have so much happening for us. It's because we are not connecting it. And the only thing that can connect those things is pan Africanism. That's the only way we are going to move forward. Now, Pan-Africanism uh, Pan Pan at, at its root is the slave rebellion. That is where it comes from. Slave rebellion in the West Indies, slave rebellion in Africa, slave rebellion in England, slave rebellion in America. This is where Pan-Africanism comes from. We have to remember that when black people were captured and taken miles, thousands of miles away from our motherland, that we have people of different background, different languages, who couldn't get along. And our captors were so clever is that they would mix us up. So you have Yorubas standing next to Bantus, Bantus standing next to Mendes, Mandis standing next to Madingos, and they all cannot get along because they don't understand each other. However, they did realize that, you know what, we may not understand each other, but we share a common goal. We need to break out of it. We need to find something that binds us. And this is where Pan-Africanism comes from. Although um, over the years, we know that so many people have been attributed to Pan-Africanism. We have people like Kwame Nkrumah, we have Marcus Gavi. Incidentally, those are the two people who I'm going to concentrate on, Pan Kwame Nkrumah and Marcus Gavi. But they're not the only Pan-Africanism. In fact, I would argue that the first Pan-Africanist in history for me is a lady. And please, viewers at home, please, my fellow panelists and everyone else, please listen carefully to me. It's a lady called Queen Nzinga. 
Queen Nzinga actually lived during the advent, the starting period of slave trade. That is when she lived. She was a ruler in what is now Angola. She was a warrior queen. And I mean warrior queen. Please, people, when you have the opportunity, please pick up a book by another very eminent late black historian called Chancellor Williams. That book is called The Destruction of Black Civilization, I believe, is the title. I read that book so many years ago. And it talks, there's a whole chapter about Queen Nzinga. This woman is powerful. This woman was, if you like, a soothsayer. She foresaw back in the 16th century some of the things that we're talking today, 500 years ago. She saw it. She saw it. She said, you know what? If we keep allowing Portuguese, Spanish, English, Germans, these people to come to our shores, masquerading as traders, masquerading as our equals, when we know that is not what they're doing, there will come a time in history where we'll perish. And lo and behold, that happened. Now we see that. So for me, she is one of the most famous Queen Nzinga. Please, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to remember that name. She was a warrior queen. She fought them tooth and nail because she understood what they were coming with. For me, that woman was the first Pan-Africanist because her fight wasn't only about her subject in Angola. She was fighting for black people all over the African country, continent, and beyond. Again, we have to be very careful when we talk about slavery, slave trade, and Pan-Africanism. Black people didn't get to the new world solely because of slave trade. No, you've had black people traveling for years. We've had black people moving around for years. If you go to places like Egypt and you see inscriptions on the walls of the pharaoh's inscriptions that goes back to pre-biblical days, you will see quite clearly paintings of black people traveling. So we've been doing all that, but there is this kind of skewed thinking by Eurocentric historians that black people only came to these parts or came to the Western Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere because of slavery. That is not true. That is not true. And this is why I'm mentioning this woman. Now, for me, there are only other people that I will mention as besides that woman. Another woman is Winnie Mandela, who we all know. Now, that woman for me is another warrior queen. In fact, she, in Winnie Mandela, what we found is the spirit of Queen Nzinga living on four or 500 years later in Winnie Mandela. And then we have people like William Dubois. We have people like, like um, Thomas Sankara. Henry Clarkson, I.T.A. Wallace Johnson. Someone asked a question about famous black historians. Well, I.T.A. Wallace Johnson was one of those people who made fabulous contribution to Pan-Africanism. Plus, Wilmot Edward Blyden, who has a very interesting history. Because for me, she's, he's, sorry, he's the sole embodiment of Pan-Africanism. Because he was born in West Indies, and he ended up in Sierra Leone and Liberia. You're not going to be any more Pan-African than that. Now, for me, those people, and then you have people like Malcolm X, you have people like um, Peter Tosh. Yes, I have to drop that name in, because that man, one of his most enduring songs, obviously, is, we all know that one, no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black man, you're an African. The most Pan-African state, pan statement that has ever been made. And then we have people who are still alive, people like the president of Ghana, who I will talk about a bit more later, and Louis Farrakhan. I know when I mention that name, Louis Farrakhan, it evokes spirits of a fiery temper in people. But you see, if we're going to get our message across, I think it's about time we start to speak to black people so they listen. Black people at times do not listen. And this is the problem we have. We're not paying attention to the things that we should be paying attention to. And this takes me to the next segment. How did Pan-Africanism contribute to African independence? Well, I mentioned two people, for example, Kwame Nkrumah and Marcus Garvey. Now, I don't even need to expouse or go more into what those two people do. Those two people are giants. They're global icons. We all know about them. Nkrumah, for example, a lot of what we see today in terms of the African Union, in terms of the call for, for a single African currency, in terms of the African continental free trade agreement that is about to come into force. I will talk about that a bit more in the next five minutes of my talk. If it wasn't for someone like Kwame Nkrumah, that wouldn't happen. But however, let's not forget that Kwame Nkrumah was actually influenced by Marcus Garvey. Now, this man was absolutely, his mind was absolutely breathtaking. He understood that our fight is a fight 
that can only be won when we pull pull our resources together. And he was talking to black people right across right across the globe. He went to America. It was in England where he actually died in England. He went to Jamaica. Now, unfortunately, he never came to Africa. But for me, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter that he never set foot in the continent that he was fighting for. I think he would have done had he not died quite young. He was only about 52 when he died because he's been through, he had been through so much that at the end, he wasn't able to see some of the things that he wanted to see. But we saw some of those things when the independent move happened. We saw some of those things with even his back, his back to Africa movement, which now we now see embodied in the year of the return that Ghana is doing. You see parallel between Marcos Gave's back to Africa movement and the thing that Nana Akufu Adu of, of Ghana, a brilliant Pan-Africanist for me, and what he is trying to, to achieve. Now, from there on, we move on to, I mean, I'm going to talk a bit more as to how Pan-Africanism has influenced modern trends. A lot of the things that we've seen. Take, for example, the Black Lives Movement. Black Lives Movement could have been named African Lives Matter. It could have been named easily. They could have said, well, you know what? The people were fighting for African-American people. They're not really African African. But the reason it's called Black Lives Matter is deliberate. It's because African-Americans in their fight, they realize and they're acknowledging that their fight is nothing if it's not connected to our fight. If it's not connected to the fight of black people right across the globe, there is no way it can be singled out. So you have Black Lives Matter. And it's interesting that the demonstrations that you saw with the death of George Floyd that triggered such a wave of condemnation right across the globe, we see those being replicated even in Nigeria. Interestingly, I saw Lewis Hamilton, who's one of our foremost, we have to celebrate that man, even though they're trying to disenfranchise, they're trying to play down his monumental achievement, people like Star, Sterling Moss or Star Jackie Stewart, or whatever he calls himself. Well, I mean, we'll save that. That's a whole different subject. We'll save that for some other time. But when I saw him wearing that T-shirt with the m -Sars and the Nigeria thing, I mean, there was a warm feeling in me. Because 10, 15, 20 years ago, that would never have happened. It would never have happened. Black people outside of the continent didn't always necessarily connect their fight to us. And the same thing for us. We didn't always connect our fight, our, our troubles to them. But when I see that, there was a warm feeling. Made. There was a realization that black people were finally getting it. We're beginning to understand that your fight is my fight. My fight is your fight. We have to take it forward. That's the only way we are going to move. So we are now beginning to link, to make visible link that our struggles transcend borders. What is happening in Nigeria would affect Nigerians in England, Nigerians in America, in Spain, in Germany, in the New World, in Brazil, everywhere. We're beginning to understand that. And that is the beautiful, it's a very beautiful thing to see. Now for me, I've always said it, and I will say this again. This is the last segment of my presentation. Pan-Africanism, the fight for political rights, the fight for social um, justice will not, and I stress this, it will not come to bear any fruit if there is no economic empowerment. There has to be economic empowerment. There's no point you fighting for social peace or political peace or religious tolerance if you don't have the money. Let's put it in cold hard terms. You don't have the money or you don't have the framework. You don't have the environment to support what you're fighting for. This is, again, where black people has been going wrong. This is where we've been going wrong. Now, Ghana, for example, their current socioeconomic gains could not have happened without a keen embrace of the works of Marcus Gavi. Even Nana Ado, the, pres the president, he openly acknowledged this in a televised statement that without Marcus Gavi, what we are achieving in Ghana today will never happen. And for me, we need to pay attention to that. Like I said, the year of the return, Ghana 2019, has its roots in the Pan-African movement. That is where it belongs. That is, where, that is what they're trying to do. And we must understand that. Now, Mr. Savage, he touched on this, about the African economy, about the African our money power. Do we have money? Hell yeah, we have money. Let me tell you something. 
Go to America, for example. The African economy, African American spending power is no less than one trillion plus dollars annually. Let me say it again. Black people, African American people in America has over one trillion, one trillion dollars to spend. Why is it that is not making any waves in Africa? Why is it not trickling down to other black people, not only in America, but black people right across the globe? Again, it's because we're not pulling our resources together. One trillion dollars represents almost the 1.551 trillion dollars that is the entire GDP of Africa. Now, don't tell me black people don't have money. We do have money. It's because we're not holding our resources. Black people will spend money on things that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It bears no food. It brings no benefit to us. The amount of time, and I'm sorry, guys, I have to say this. The amount of times I see people walking down the street, full pride, wearing their Manchester United T-shirt, the Arsenal T-shirt, same people that won't wear Leon Stars T-shirt, won't wear Nigeria T-shirt, won't wear Jamaica T-shirt, but you're happy to wear the T-shirt of a company that don't even recognize black people. We're happy to walk around, wear something that has to do with someone like, for example, like a Tommy Hilfiger, a man who's on record for saying that my clothes are not for black people. And yet black people go out there, spend money, but we need to pull our resources together. For me, the only way we're going to be able to do that is we not only tap into our resources, but we must understand that Pan-Africanism is what binds us together. Not only during the independence, but in the post-independence world, it's what binds us together. Your fight is my fight. My fight is your fight. That is the way we have got to approach it. And for me, Last but not least, I must close by saying this. As African people at home and in the diaspora, we must remember that if we are going to transform our collective fortunes, it's Pan-Africanism or we perish. Please remember this, Pan-Africanism or we perish. I thank you very much. Wow. Now, <clears throat> ladies and gen now, ladies and gentlemen and all, as you can see or you have heard, this is the beginning of a new way of looking at things. I am totally aware of the time, and as I said at the Onset, I do not have the control that I usually have in order to keep all of us within time. But I very, very much appreciate all the efforts and uh, what people have said. So I promise <clears throat> you that this is the beginning. And as we speak, I have set another date for last Friday in November. I really don't know what I will be doing then or anything else because we will not finish this debate with all the passion that we have here, we will not finish as I planned us to finish. So, section two, who says there is a taster? This was your taster. Section two is going to be postponed to be combined into another event where we would describe it as what should black people be doing to take this situation forward. The sec section two was going to be people talking about what that should be. Now I have decided to create a new session unilaterally. My, my chairman and deputy chair lady and everybody else will be pissed off with me, but I apologize. We cannot do all in one day. That's what I am seeing. We still have two speakers and one poem to go. So I suggest that we postpone the other parts for another day as we try to finish with our speakers. And I don't want to hurry them because there's a lot of passion going on. And um, what that means is we would go to our next speaker very quickly. And um, I'm going to implore Mr. James Thorpe to see if he 
can buck the trend and give us his presentation in 10 minutes. James Eddie Thorpe, AKA, otherwise known as JT Money, is an alumni of West African Methodist Collegiate School. Thank God we get a proper school. Current United Kingdom alumni president. Now I said, thank God we have a proper school because I want to celebrate my own schooling because nobody mentioned it. And I will be putting the Bishop Johnson Memorial School close to the collegiate school as we make progress taking the schools of Sierra Leone ahead. James is an accounting graduate with an MBA in finance. He currently works as a finance manager at Greenwich Mencap. He could not go a day without his rice and good soup. He is a talented musician and a motivator. He hates injustice, injustices of any kind. James Thorpe. Oh, I forgot to mention that he is a keen musician. What the hell? I did say talented musician and motivator, but I really missed. You want to hear him sing, not today. James Thorpe, over to you. Oh, <laughs> wow. That, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, um, Sir Victor, the octopus. And it's a really privilege, you know, checking the time now. It's really a privilege for me to be here with, you know, such a caliber of people here, you know, um, you know, talking about something we're passionate about. So without much ado, I just want to say thank you very much um, to the organizers as well. And Mr. Prince, um, probably I just might w just want to put the word that you were just talking about, the Pan-Africanism, into a simple English that we need to come together. This is time for us to come together. And I will be talking about compassion and working together and for very few minutes here, yeah. So, yes, this is a wonderful night for us, a wonderful night for us, you know. And, you know, this month is the month that we celebrate our Black History Month. I can see some people are saying, why just one month? But I think it's good for us to celebrate this month because we, we need to know our history, the actual history, you know, the proper history, the correct history, because down the line, it's been whitewashed. And so it's good for us to celebrate. Yes, we can celebrate our lives every day, but it's good to have time where we can, you know, celebrate our history and know our history. And that's why we're here tonight. And I do believe, you know, that we should all have compassion. We should have compassion within ourselves. For Africa to move from where it is at the moment, we need to have passion from within ourselves, within the community, and then you can take it to nationwide, you know. We have, um, you know, different abilities. We are diverse in different ways, but having compassion and coming together will take us to places. And without much ado, I will start my presentation today. We need to know what is compassion, first of all. Compassion. And when you look at the dictionary from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, um, it says, is the sympathetic consciousness of others distressed together with a desire to alleviate it. And from the New Oxford American Dictionary also defines that compassion as a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. You know, so we need to have the desire to have, alleviate the sufferings. And that should be our thinking as Africans as well. And when you look at um, what um, Albert, um, Albert Einstein said in one of his quotes, he said, a human being is a part of a whole called by us universe. A part limited in time and space. His experience, himself, his through thoughts and feeling as something separated from the rest. A kind of optical delusion of his consciousness 
The delusion is a kind of prison for us, retracting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves, to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty, in its beauty. So we can see what a wonderful quote there. And most of the time in the UK, people talk about minority and all those bits. Yes, in numbers time, yeah, we're minorities or whatever. But in terms of actually those that are suffering, we're not a minority. And those that we need to work together, the Africans, the black Africans, we need to work together. We are not a minority though, because most people are suffering. But we need to have that compassion where we can come together and work as a team. Otherwise, there's no way we can be able to do some stuff. We need to come together. And I will advise us, you know, viewers out there, we need to act justly and we need to work humbly and we need to love mercy. Talking about mercy for a very short while, you know, we look at Sierra Leone, I refer to Sierra Leone because that's where I came from. And we have been practicing revenge politics, but it's high time for us to come together. It's high time for us to have compassion for one another and stop the revenge politics. If we are to progress as a nation and Africa as a whole, we need to have mercy we need to have mercy let us love mercy and let us forgive one another for us to move forward you know and that's why i keep telling people for me i really don't respect you know people because of their qualifications you know their wealth their power their talent you know or anything that could place them above someone else i do, but i do respect someone by the way they treat others i do respect them by the way they treat others. And that's what we should focus on. Blacks have been treated unfairly. Yes, we know that. We all have, we have reasons to be so angry at our white counterpart. Yes, but it's time for us. It's time for us to think how we can work together as an allied force, black people, how we can work together, forgiving one another because if you look at the history how, you should, how black history didn't start from slavery you know it didn't start from slavery or ends after slavery we have been <laughs> we've got people you know before slavery doing tremendous stuff for black people so we need to know our history and we should not be whitewashed by our history you know we have seen too much darkness too much darkness you know, let every tongue speak out for justice with compassion and kindness. We look example like the death of Judge Floyd, Trevor Martins, even this coronavirus, everything working against us. Why? So we need to get together and start speaking out for any form of injustice. Don't say it doesn't concern me. Please let us speak out for injustice. And because of time, I'll quickly move on. I'll quickly, quickly move on. That I have one quote from the, the, the American Negro song. And I, I know most people probably haven't heard that. But it's from the song titled, Lift Every Voice. You know, we say, Stony Road, Stony the Road we showed, Bitter the Chastening Road, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not a weary fit come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last. We should stand together. Let us stand together. And in conclusion, because of time, in conclusion, I will take you guys to... Um, a poem, or probably now a poem, is a quote from Things Fall Apart 
by Chinu Achebe. It says, a man who calls his kinsmen to a feast does not do so to redeem them from starving. They all have food in their own houses. When we gather in the moonlight at the village ground, it is not because of the moon. Every man can see it in his own compound. We come together because it is good for kinsmen to do so. Therefore, let us continue with a team spirit and enjoy the power of togetherness. Let's smile, not because we don't have problems, but because we are stronger than the problems. Alone, I can smile, but together we can celebrate. Alone, I can talk, but together we can speak. Let's promote things that unite us than things that cause disunity. Unity is a great strength. Everyone is important to their own unique purpose. Never look down on anyone. Never look down on anyone. Let us come together and stay blessed. Thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation with passion. And I could feel the compassion as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Top a.k.a. JT Money. Um, I think we're ready. Uh, we're still 22.31. We're ready to do the next two sessions, the next two uh, uh, bits, which are the final poem for the night, and then we would go to our director of communications and public engagement who would round up this first session which unfortunately is going to be the only session. Dr. Kayo de Robin Coca. Thank you. Uh, my uh, third and final reading is from The Meaning of Africa. It's a brilliantly evocative poem by the erudite Sierra Leonean polymath, Dr. David Zinnikul. Viewers will know of Dr. Nichols' many groundbreaking achievements, including being the first African to graduate with a first-class honors degree from Cambridge, the first African fellow of a Cambridge college, and a man whose 1958 PhD thesis on the breakdown of insulin in the human body was a game changer for the treatment of diabetes. What I think is less well known is the fact that he was also quite a successful creative writer who even won the um, Margaret Wrong Commonwealth Prize for and medal for literature in Africa in 1952. Uh, he did this writing under the pseudonym of Abiyose Nico. So what we're going to listen to is um, an extract from one of his um, best poems, I would say, The Meaning of Africa. Uh, Jack Maestro, please. Poems for the New Normal, selected and read by Kayode Adesimi. Poem number two. Extracts from The Meaning of Africa by Abia Seniko. Africa, you were once just a name to me, but now you lie before me with somber green challenge to that loud faith for freedom, life more abundant, which we once professed, shouting into the silent listening microphone or on an alien platform to a sea of white perplexed faces, troubled with secret imperial guilt, shouting of you with a vision euphemistic as you always appear to your lonely sons on distant shores. So I came back, sailing down the Guinea coast, loving the sophistication of your brave new cities, Dakar, Accra, Cotonou, Lagos, 
Bathurst and Bissau, Liberia, Freetown, Libreville. Freedom is really in the mind. Go up country, so they said, to see the real Africa. For whomsoever you may be, that is where you come from. Go for bush, inside the bush. You will find your hidden heart, your mute ancestral spirit. So I went, dancing on my way. Now you lie before me, passive, with your unanswering green challenge. Is this all you are? This long, uneven red road? This occasional succession of huddled heaps of four mud walls and thatched falling grass roofs, sometimes ennobled by a thin layer of white plaster and covered with thin, slanting, corrugated zinc. An overloaded lorry speeds madly towards me, full of produce, passengers, with driver leaning out into the swirling dust to pilot his swinging, obsessed vehicle along. Beside him on the raised seat, his first-class passenger, clutching and timid. But he drives on at so, so many miles per hour, peering out with bloodshot eyes, unshaved face and dedicated look, his motto painted on each side. Sunshine transport, we get you there quick, quick. The Lord is my shepherd. The red dust settles down on the green leaves. I know you will not make me want, Lord, though I have reddened your green pastures. It is only because I have wanted so much that I have always been found wanting. From south and east and from my west, the sandy desert holds enough. We look across a vast continent and blindly call it ours. You are not a country, Africa. You are a concept fashioned in our minds each to each to hide our separate fears, to dream our separate dreams. Only those within you who know their circumscribed plot and till it well with steady plough can from that harvest then look up to the vast blue inside of the enamel bowl of sky which covers you and say, this is my Africa, meaning I am content and happy. I am fulfilled within, without and roundabout. I have gained the little longings of my hands, my loins, my heart, and the soul that follows in my shadow. I know now that is what you are, Africa. Happiness, contentment, and fulfillment, and a small bird singing on a mango tree. This reading is dedicated to the memory of the author, Dr. David Sinico, R.I.P. Daddy. Good. Uh, welcome back. Thank you very much for that uh, poem, Dr. Kyle de Robinkoka. And um, we are now at the last, uh, with the last speaker for tonight. We've heard from four people, and we are now going to hear from Mariama Kamara. Mariama is going to talk to us about great black women in history and what we can learn from them. Maria Kamara, Mariama Kamara is an alumni of Hagerstein Girls School. 
She is a psychology graduate with a master's in de development studies. She is the founder and director of Smiling Through Light, which focuses on clean energy access. She has a background in international development and programs. Like me, she loves potato leaves and she dislikes lies and hypocrisy. She is an exercise and meditation nutter. And I use the word advisedly, nutter. She is nuts about exercise and meditation. She loves traveling and exploring new cultures and learning from them. Mariama, Kamara, your stage to give us the last presentation. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to say thank you for having me here. And hopefully, I would cleave um, with really inspirational thoughts. So I'm normally a free speaker, but because I really wanted to get my points across, I've just drawn up some notes. Okay. I was conductor of the underground, underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger, Harriet Tubman. If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the touches in the wood, keep going. If they shout enough to you, keep going. Do not ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Harriet Tubman. They say that winners write history and losers poetry. But in this case, where the following women were absolute winners, they were unfairly left out of the pages of history books or just mentioned in a sentence or two failing to provide them with credit that they deserved. Because as history and the media shows us, the voices of black women are the ones that usually get silent. Well, I hope this moment is about to change and it is our responsibility to change this and make the difference. Black History Month 2020 is a time for people to come together and hopefully learn lessons from the present and the future. It is a time to reclaim history and we imagine how a shared history will be told in the future. Black people have always made history and always will, but it is equally important that black people take the lead on how that history is discovered, explored, researched, recorded, archived, and shared. We have heard of the following people, a few names to say. Sonja Turner, Daisy Bates, Rosa Parks, Angela Davids, Harriet Tubman. All excellent women who have all been in the struggle to fight to see freedom in their own different ways and rights. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a greater need for women leadership in different sectors. I think mm -hmm. it's now that as women, we start tackling crucial issues that are affecting us within the 21st century. And this can be done in many ways using your voice, creating employment, law reform, fighting against injustice, and working towards inequality. Leaders show their strength when challenges are large and the dreams are big. And as women, we continue to show this. In the Leadership Challenge, a best-selling book, the authors outline 30 behaviors and five practices of exemplary leadership. Number one, model the way. Number two, inspire a shared vision. Number three, challenge the process. Number four, enable others to act. And number five, encourage the heart. I would like to now use these different models to just speak about the life of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was born in slavery in Maryland around 1820. Her given name was Amita Minty Rose. As a child, she learned Bible studies from her mother, finding inspiration in the Exodus narrative and rejecting 
how slaves were treated. She would later be become known as Moses for her work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, leading slaves north to freedom. She was injured around the age of 13 when she was hit in the head with a heavy metal that was actually being thrown at a runaway slave. For the rest of her life, she suffered headaches and also powerful visions and vivid dreams, which she believed came from God talking to her. She got married at the age of 24 to John Tubman, who was a free man. Harriet was a great woman. She escaped and left at the age of 29. She then changed her name to Harriet Tubman. Harriet continued traveling 90 miles using the Underground Railway to Pennsylvania and freedom. This is the first lesson for all of us. Perseverance, grit, and toughness are a lesson. Dealt with an incredible challenging situation, she was able to overcome enormous odds to accomplish a goal of freedom. Harriet had a taste of freedom and her belief that everyone else should. During her time at the Underground Railroad, um, Railroad, which was a network of free blacks and white abolitionists, Harriet could have said, okay, I'm free now. I've done what I set out to do. I've achieved the goal of freedom, but she didn't. She didn't sit there idly and enjoy the freedom she earned. She dedicate, dedicated herself to helping others accomplish that dream of freedom. She used her knowledge to help others accomplish the dream. Lesson two, leadership is about what we do with others, not for ourselves. She started working on, in the Underground Railroad to assist people to reach freedom and took several missions through 1850s. When the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 rendered free slaves of the Union as unsafe destination for escaped slaves, Harriet began working with different abolitionists. She carried on helping. Due to the Fugitive Slave Act, Harriet moved her base to operations in Canada and enrouted the Underground Railroad to help slaves reach the safety of Canada. She worked rescuing families from bondage for almost a decade. Lesson three, we might encounter circumstances in which we have to modify our approaches and path to reach certain goals and dreams in our life. During the Civil War, even as successful as she was working as a conductor, she could have still said, I want to stop now. But she supported, she was a nurse, she cooked and assisted the Union First Forces. She helped recruit former slaves for, the, for, the, for a regiment of African-American soldiers. She even served as a spy and scout for the army. Lesson four, we can challenge a process by serving in different roles to accompany that dream. In 1863, Tubman was the first woman to lead an assault during the Civil War when she led a raid that freed 700 slaves prior to the signing of the M M Emancipation Proclamation by Lincoln later that year. When the war ended, she returned to New York. A, um, a bibliography entitled Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman was published in 1869 by Sarah Hopkins Bradford. Later on, a second one was published, Tubman, Harriet, the Moses of her people, almost two decades later. Lesson five, never give up. I know this sounds really easy, but it's always worth it. Lesson six, document your story so that others can learn from you. Harriet was a leader to the end. She continued to inspire and sh inspire people with a shared vision and challenge the process. She became involved in women's suffragette movement. She gave speeches in several cities about the need to give women the vote. At age 80, Harriet donated her property to the African Methodist Church, which was then, then converted to a home for the old. Harriet died in 1913. Just before her death, she told those who gathered around her, I go to prepare a place for you. Lesson seven, we should all learn this from Harriet. Even till her last age, her vision continued. She continued to help people, continued to make their lives better. 
on to, on, for, the, for the best. Ariette Tubman is an outstanding model of someone whose vision for what needed to change in the world drove her to make it come to fruition. I would like to say it's not our situation and resources that limit what we can do by any of us. It is the size and clarity of our dreams and the grit, creativity, and strength to bring it to life. I hope this can be an inspiration to all of us to never give up on what we believe in. And as women, we continue the fight to free people within our different communities. Harriet Tubman says it the best. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lady Mariama Kamara. I, um, I can't help but be moved by all the things that you said. I am aware of our time. And as I conclude, because conclude I must, I leave you with a thought that is well expressed by one of my favorite um, debaters, Professor Patrick Lumumba. I am sure he was quoting from somebody else who said it, but I am quoting it because I heard him say it. He says there are three enemies that have been identified against black people. Poverty, diseases, and ignorance. He said education is the key that opens the doors of prosperity. It is an equalizer of men and women. The mind is the standard of the man and woman and the center of all decision making. No matter how tall you are, if your mind is not developed, you are just a tall fool. No matter how short you are, if your mind is not developed, you are just a short fool. Education is key. Now, I would like to invite the chairman of this, of Sega Unions for Development to give us his summary and a vote of thanks. His name is well known in our community. He is no other than Zach Smith. He is an alumni of Prince of Wales School, the Frabe College University of Sierra Leone, and the Greenwich University. Zach is a geology graduate with a postgraduate diploma in management studies. Zach belongs to the Association of Project Management Practitioner. He is currently the Operational Delivery Manager of the London Underground. He loves chicken, or chicken fried rice, and he hates seafood. He eats sardines, though. <laughs> He claims to be able to see the steps of a black cat on a black surface at night. He is an ardent and dedicated senior Freemason. Zach Smith has been a Freemason since Noah 
was a boy. <laughs> Zach Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor Maurice Finney. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. The year 2020 has been the most challenging this side of the notice for all of us with the debilitating pandemic of coronavirus. Hopes were dashed, expectations stifled, and plans canceled or shelved. However, sometimes it is during times of adversity and despair that good things are born. Sierra Leoneans for Development being one such entity. We rose from the doldrums of the pandemic and will now be a force to reckon with. Our purpose, mission, vision and values are clear and we will strive to make the required difference in Sierra Leone and the diaspora. What an excellent and enjoyable evening it has been. Mr. Maurice Ferenke Koroma, thank you for the vision, passion, and commitment for tonight's event. You are a true pioneer and visionary. A big thank you goes out to our backroom IT personnel. You are simply the best in the business. William Johnson Cole and Femi Palmer. To our dynamic, intelligent, and lovable panelists, we say thanks for the emancipation, the education, and the enjoyment of tonight's event. To Maria Makar, Mariama Kamara, our go-getter. Mr. Zinu Ofosu Savage, our deep thinker. Mr. James Thorpe, our shrewd contriver. Dr. Kayode Robin Coker, our encyclopedia. Mr. Prince Williams, our sharpshooter, and Miss Petrina Aisatu Ndimo Kamara, our lovable strategist and optimist. Petrina, you are a wonder unto many. Despite your ongoing personal challenges, you insisted on being part of the panel further demonstrating your resilience and determination. SL4D stands with you in the fight. Panelists, you have all discharged the duty entrusted to you this evening with candor, professionalism, and yet such alacrity and zest, so much that all of us in the audience are leaving this event far more knowledgeable and educated in our history than when we logged on. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a popular saying from Arthur Conan Doyle. Mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself, but talent instantly recognizes genius. Mr. Victor Maurice Finney, our CEO, we thank you and formally state on record our appreciation for that zeal, drive, and commitment that has earned you the aptly named alias, Chief Octopus. If there ever was a person who can juggle more balls than a sac de soleil artist. It is you. Well done to you and your team of directors. We look forward to many more successes in the future. To the general membership of SL4D, 
Sincere thanks for taking up the mantle and being committed. We have just started. SL4D will become a household name worldwide by the time we are halfway through. To our adorable audience who've joined us this evening, we hope we have made it worth your while. Thank you for believing in us and choosing us this evening. Finally, on behalf of my deputy chair and the board of trustees of Sierra Leoneans for Development, we extend our heartfelt thanks and appreciation to everyone. Stay tuned. There is a new sheriff in town, SL4D. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Zach Smith. I, uh, I am lost for words, but as I said earlier, as I should conclude, conclude I must. It's bang on 11 o'clock. We now need to move in to the actual celebration. I want to thank everybody listeners, viewers on Facebook, on YouTube, for staying the cause with us. And we promise we will be back. This is just the beginning. Now, yeah, there's more. Did I hear somebody say there's more? All right. It's probably my children trying to tell me that that it's 11 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for everything that you've put together, the team. And um, thank you, listeners and viewers from all around the globe. We hope to be back soon. We now have the bit that I said I was looking forward to, which is there is no celebration without a drink. A glass, a bottle, whichever one you take. Get your dancing shoes on. We are about to join. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's why I like. Look at that. You see, the chairman's bottle is a huge bottle. Look at mine. <laughs> That's why he's chairman. Uh, thank you very much. We are now about to join the link which we have organized specifically for Sierra Leoneans for Development to join the DJ Gravy as he celebrates with us for the next hour and a half. And I do believe if we offer him a couple of glasses of red wine, bottles of Guinness, he probably would continue till 1 a.m. But we've got a schedule till 12.30, but let's see how it goes. You're probably not going to hear from me anymore. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And I hand over to our techie, who is going to connect us to the music. The Honorable Femi Pama. I mean, can we speak?
That day you be